Hey guys, welcome back to another video and we will just continue on working on our application. So the next thing we needed to do was make this page more dynamic. So last, last time we made it so that we can save our name, but we need to actually add a search box and also the search results. So today we'll learn something new about API calls and let's create the search box. So if we open our home component here, we just have a title right now, but we actually need to add a search box here. So let's create a new folder inside of our components and we'll just call it search for now. And we will make another folder inside of this called search bar because we will also have search results, remember. So we can create our search bar component here. So for the search bar, we will just return an input box with a class name here. And obviously it needs a value and also we need to store the value so that whenever the component re-renders, we need to uh, keep that state. So we obviously need a use state here. So we will name our variable search term, which will again use the use state hook. And then if we go back to our home component, we can add our search bar. Make sure to export the function here. Okay, so we do have a search bar, but it looks pretty weird right now. So let's open our dev console and see, let's see what's going on. Um, so as we can see, the DOM here says there's a hello and then there's an input box for our name. Then there's an input box right under that. So the problem here is the, the title, the title does not have the input box inside of it. So ideally we would want everything to be centered, right? So we, what we could do is, the one thing we could do is put the search bar inside of the title, but that wouldn't really make a lot of sense. The title should just be the title and the home page has the title and a search bar inside of it. So we need to actually make the home page be the, behave the same way the title does, which is to um, make everything centered. So we can add the same kind of display here. So display flex, remember? And the flex direction in this case will be column. Because, because we don't want everything to be right next to each other. We want everything to be stacked on top of each other. So if we do that, if we go ahead and do that, we get a search bar that's kind of in the middle because it's spanning across the entire page. Um, but we do have it in the center. So the only thing we could do is since we do need the home page to be the entire width of the page, but we don't want the title or the input, the search box to be the entire width of the page. So we do need to create a max width for this one so what we'll do is we need to wrap both of these inside of another div so a div with a class name maybe called content um, or you could also make some utility classes if you like so the one this is one thing that i do like to do is max let's say 800 so this could be your class name and if we go to our base file we can add a max 800 class what which you guessed it this will just add max width 800 uh, pixels. So this is a, a common pattern from a lot of frameworks out there. For example, Bootstrap will do something like this. So you can add your own utility classes. Uh, so you don't have to add your classes inside of the home page itself. But if the class name here is max 800, it'll just apply a maximum height or maximum width of 800. So let's see what that looks like. So that does look good. Um, I mean, it, it has a maximum width of 800, but it is not centered. So it, it, to make that centered, we could add a center style here. And in the base, what we could, we can add another center. And the way to make block styles, or sorry, block elements centered, we need to add a margin of zero on the top and bottom and auto on the left and right. So if we add that styling, now everything is centered because there's an automatic margin on the left and right of our, of our div here. So max 800 has some margin on the left and some margin on the right. That's dependent on your page size. Okay, great. 
So now let's focus on our input box. And in the class, what we need to target this search box. So we will take this class name and let's let's make it with 100% because we want it to be 100% of the, the parent. Um, or actually, let's go, let's go back to our design because I don't think it's 100% of our um, parent. So now here, it looks like it is. Um, but this should actually have a maximum height. So it's got a width of 437. Um, so we'll just round that off to 440. And that could be a maximum width because you're maybe a, a cell phone or something has a, a smaller width. So we can add a max width and also a, a width of 100%. So it'll try to make it 100%, um, but it'll max out at 440 pixels. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Uh, it's just not centered anymore. So that's because we added our new max 800 uh, div here, which has a center, but that's actually making itself center. So one way we could fix that is also with Flexbox. So what we can do is add a flex column to our max 800 and center. So let's create another utility class because this is something that we would use a lot. So we can use some SAS here and create some variables. So we will add a dot flex here, which will all it'll do is add display flex. And then we'll add a column class. So what, what this will do is it'll extend flex and it'll also make it flex direction column. We don't need a, a class for uh, flex direction row because flex by itself is row at default. So let's add that now to our list of classes here. Let's make it flex, or sorry, it should be flex column. We'll add a column class. And now everything is centered and the input box is now inside of the flex column component. So we need to actually make this input box look a little bit more like our design is. Um, so let's do that and I, I will go ahead and do that and show you what styles need to be applied. Okay, so now our input box looks like this and if I type in a zip code, you know, it, it looks the way our design is. Um, now let's see what it took to actually get to accomplish that. So the first thing is we increased the height and we also added some margin at the top so that it, it's a little bit hanging off the top from the title. And the font size should be increased. Border radius is what makes it rounded on the edges. So at, we added 20 pixels on each corner. Um, the border is none. Remember, we had to also do that for the title or for the name here. Um, the background is this special RGBA color. So this is basically white, so everything's 255. And then the A is for alpha. So alpha is the transparency, so it looks a little transparent. Um, and the color is for the text color, and text align will be how it is aligned, how the text inside of the input box is aligned. So it should be in the center. So that's all that took for making our text box looking like our design. So of course we need to actually add our callbacks here. So on, on change of our input box, we need to call set. We can create a new function here with the event as we did. So our value will actually be in event.target.value. And we just need to set that to our search term. And the actual value that should be displayed in here should be search term. So everything should still work normally and that it does. So now we are gonna use this as a zip code. So we obviously do not want, you know, 10 digit long zip codes. It should be maximum five. Um, so we, we do need to create some validation rules here so that the user does not make any mistakes. Also, we can actually type in any anything here. So we should only be able to type um, numbers because we are limiting this right for right now to US zip codes. So that should be five digits only. So to avoid people typing in any letters that they want, we're actually going to use some regex. So there's this amazing tool online called regex101.com. You should totally use this. So we'll just create our test string here. So we'll just type in some numbers for now. And our string, we want only numbers. So it should fail if there's any character. 
So we'll create a, a zero through nine. So that's what we want. And we actually wanted to start with zero through nine. So the, this character says the, the starting of the string. And we also wanted to end exactly with uh, um, a number. And we can have infinitely as many numbers. So the plus says we, it's zero through as many as you like. Um, and the, the dollar sign is the end of the string. So as we can see, this one has is a match. As soon as we add a letter, it says that it doesn't match. And if we add a letter in the middle or in the end, anywhere, it just does not match. So that seems to be a good string for us to use. So let's go to our app and create a new, new regular expression. Uh, numbers only. And we'll just, in JavaScript, all you have to do is type in your regex inside of two, inside of two slashes, or you could actually make use of new reg, regex class and then give it your regular expression. But this should now be a string. So that looks good. So now what we should do is, um, I've just created a function here instead of adding, adding it in line. Um, so if the value is this, now if value, the length of the value is less than six, meaning it's five or less. So that's, that's what we want. Yeah. So if the value is less than six, we need to see if they are numbers or not. So, um, so if it's less than six and numbers only dot test. So the test, if we command click on this test will be, it will take a string and it'll return a Boolean. So it'll check if the regular expression is matched or not matched. So in our, in our example here, this would return true and this would return false. So let's, that seems perfect for us. So what we can do is pass it the value. So this should go inside of the if statement and let's see what that looks like. Okay, so now this is refreshed and if I type in some letters, I'm really trying, it just does not accept it. And if I type in numbers, then it accepts it up to five numbers. Um, so let's go in and backspace out. So now we have a problem. We can't actually backspace the last character or the first character. So why is that? Well, if we see th if the value dot length is less than six, that's fine. Um, but this will return false if it's a empty string. So what we should actually do is add a if statement here for val. If the value does not exist, then we should just set it to empty string. So if we get an empty string in here, it'll just set it to empty string. Otherwise, it'll move on and check the re regular expression. Okay, so now I can still type in numbers. And if I backspace out, I can go all the way back. All right, so now we have the state being set and we are actually updating the input box, but we should actually now start reacting to it, right? So we need to use an effect. Basically, if the this will be an effect for the search term, so we can add that inside of the array here. And what, what do we need to actually check? Well, if search term length is exactly five, which means that it's a valid zip code and we only set it if it's all numbers, um, so we actually need to now call the API. So this will be, you know, call API here. So how do we actually call this API? Before we actually start calling some APIs, we need to do a little bit of setup and understand what we're actually trying to do. So I'm going to use this website called openweathermap.org, which has some APIs that we can use for free. Um, all you have to do is sign in and then go to this API tab. So once you have already signed in, you can get uh, access to all these APIs. Some of them are paid, some of them are free. Um, for example, this one is for free and paid versions, and this one is for free and paid versions. So for the search terms, we are actually going to be using the current weather data. So this will get, basically give us the current weather for the search term that the user has typed in, which is exactly what we need, right? So here we have the current weather and it's for New York City and it's based on this zip code. So how do we actually start calling this? So, well, let's first look at the API doc. So the API here says this is the URL and this is the path with data version 2.5 weather and then a query. So if we scroll down and read this a little bit, it, we have geographical coordinates and we also have the zip code. 
So that this one seems perfect for us. So all we need is this URL and then the zip code, which we get from the user, the country code um, here. If it's the country code, if you skip it, then it'll be the United States by default, um, which is also good. And then we have this app ID and then the API key. So th that's a little, this is something that we do need because otherwise open weather map does not know who is calling the API and they would not be able to monitor the paid and the free versions. So if I click on this API key, um, this is a page with the list of all my API keys. So this is basically a, a random letter and number combination, but you should always keep this safe and you should never show it to anybody. Um, this will probably be blurred in the video. Um, so what we do actually need to do is you need to generate an API key from this right hand side, just name it whatever you need, and then it'll show up on the left. So once you have this API key after signing up, you can start actually calling this um, API with your own API key. Now remember, this is a very secure uh, key. You should never actually commit it or show it to anybody. Basically don't share it with anyone if you're actually starting to pay for this um, because they can act as your application and uh, abuse your account. So the question is we have a front end application and we don't actually have a server at all. So how will that work? Because you know we, we have to call the API key in, inside of here. Uh, this is maybe not in the scope of this project. So one thing that you do need to understand is that API calls should always be routed through your own server. So if we go to a, a drawing board, I can explain a little bit better here. Okay, so let's say we have a user here and the user's got its own laptop here. And what they're going to do is uh, try to find our application on the internet. So we should have some server which includes our client side. And the client is nothing but you know the index file, the HTML, and all of the JavaScript that the user needs to download on their computer. But it's also going to have uh, probably a big server or a small server based on your needs. So the client side actually gets delivered to this uh, laptop. And for right now in our project, we're going to have the key inside of the client because we don't have a server. But this is totally wrong. This, this is, should never happen in a production environment. You should always store the key inside of your server. And I'll explain why and how that would work. So now we have this other server, which is the weather server. And the weather API is, you know, not in our control. So for, for this project, what we are doing is from this client, we are making an API call directly to the weather API. And again, this should never happen. What should actually happen is we make a call to our own server from the client, so the, from the JavaScript, we make a server call. So what the server is going to do is take this request and say, okay, hey, this, this request needs to be going to the weather API. So what it's going to do is modify the, the request and attach the key to, he, to this request and then forward the request onto the weather server. So again, this should never happen. This is wrong and we should always route through the server down to another server, which is the weather server. And then the response will go back to our own server and then it'll be routed back to our user. So this way the key is never exposed and the user has no idea what the key is. But again, for this scope of the project, we're storing the key in the client side. Um, so inside of this HTML, the user will know the key just for simplicity's sake. Okay, so in the next video, we'll actually make our API call here now that we have a key. Um, so if the search term is five, then we make the API call and display the results on the page. So stay tuned for that and make sure you subscribe if you wanna learn more about React.js, JavaScript, and different front-end technologies.